welcome to this public meeting organised by Hexham Constituency Labour Party. We're delighted to welcome Jamie Driscoll, Mayor of the North of Tyne Combined Authority. Um, Jamie's going to talk to us, as you all probably know, about um, what is levelling up. I'm Diana Carney, um, I'm Vice Chair of Bywell Branch Labour Party and a delegate to Hexham CLP. I've been asked to chair this meeting and I must say I'm very much looking forward to listening to what Jamie has to say. Um, Jamie will talk for about 20 minutes and then take questions, uh, which I will moderate. Now, a brief introduction to Jamie. He was elected as our mayor in 2019. He immediately prioritised creating green jobs and decarbonising our economy. He's positioning the North of Tyne as a clear national leader on green growth. In terms of levelling up, he has several very interesting ideas which, if implemented, would go some way to making sure that wealth generated in the region stays in the region. Jamie provides dynamic leadership over a wide range of important projects. For example, offshore wind, the culture and creative sector, and in support of technology startups. So, join me in welcoming our Mayor, Jamie Driscoll. Thank you, Diana. Um, and um, actually, this is obviously a rescheduled meeting. Um, it was uh, due to take place, and then um, Her Majesty the Queen died. So. Um, here we are all again and, uh, and it's gone on. Um, but it's great to see such a turnout despite that. So busy that we've actually got people sitting in the front row. <laughs> uh, it's my, my actually last public appearance in Hexham was unplanned. Uh, so this is August time, it was at Hexham Abbey when the handlebars were playing and doing Twelfth Night. Uh, a rare evening off and I was out with my family uh, with a picnic in the front row line there and I'd had a bottle of beer and they dragged me up out of the audience to take the part of one of the cast um, and being a politician I've got the ability to overact terribly so it did work quite well and then afterwards they say we didn't realise you were the mayor that's not why we got you up so um, I love coming to Hexham uh, so just a little bit of introduction can I have a quick show of hands how many here are Labour Party members and how are oh. So, so quite a few. And how many are just members of the public who've come along? Oh, so that's so, so, uh, roughly, slightly more members of the public. That's great. Um, so a little bit of introduction then. Um, if you're Labour Party members, you get emails from me um, on a regular basis. But for the rest of you, um, I um, actually, there was a film made, there's a camera crew followed me around for my first year in office. Um, which was quite interesting because people said, well, what's, what's this socialist mayor going to be like? Will he be able to work with the Conservatives? Will he be able to work with business? Um, and um, I do have some strong views on things. I have very strong views on um, violence against women and girls. Um, the background, I always wear the, the white ribbon pin. Um, that's coming up uh, at the weekend, so if anyone can join that campaign, that would be great. Um, and that, that's something I learned from my man who set up the, um, the what was in those days called the Battle of Wives Home, the, Refuge for Domestic Violence in Middlesbrough um, and as but I'm an engineer I'm very pragmatic and a systems thinker and what I want to make sure we have is a long term sustainable future and that's got to be sustainable environmentally of course if the, if the planet's unable to support us that's a problem but it's got to be financially sustainable and we've got to make the best use and the wise use of the money we've got available. And it's got to be socially sustainable because if it starts excluding certain sections of our community, that does us a huge disservice and it causes problems down the line. Um, so I'm very um, in favour of doing the best for working people to make sure that they're earning a good living. And on the climate, it's about telling the truth. Um, the the group Extinction Rebellion had three demands. One was declare a climate emergency, which we did. Two was to tell the truth about the reality of it, which I always do. Uh, and the third was to hold a citizen's assembly on climate change, which we did. So we're, we're making good progress on that. And in terms of working with businesses, 
Uh, let's have a look see. So I'll tell you a story actually. There's a company called Norfram who we helped win a multi-million pound contract uh, with some investments in new CNC machines. And as I like to do, I go and talk to the people. And was talking to one guy, his name's Dale, and he was operating his machine. I said, well, what's the difference to you, Dale? What difference has it made? He says, well, I used to work away a lot. So where was that? He says, in the Baltic, um, often a lot in Latvia. Uh, he says, wow, that's quite a shift. So what's the difference has it made to your life? He says, I'm here every night and I've got a young daughter and I get to read her a bedtime story. And when you hear things like that, you get to see that's what levelling up really is. Now, I would imagine most people here have grown up and are familiar with Auf Wiedersehen. And that was the story of Geordies, people from the northeast and around the country, unable to find enough decent, well-paid work in their area. So that's really what we're, we're fixing. And I've worked with so many businesses. There's a, a company called Sweet Dreams over in Cramlington. Um, and they're a chocolate manufacturer. And that was one of my favourite factory visits. Um, and you don't think of chocolate as being high tech. But they make, or are capable of making, small batch manufactured Easter eggs. And they have computer controlled welding machines to make Easter eggs. Now who'd have thought of that? And as a result of us helping them increase the electricity supply in there, there's about, I think there's about 16 new people working there now on a production line in a chocolate factory. And that's some people's dream job, isn't it? Um, but we've worked with a lot of large businesses as well. Verishir was the first large business that we brought here. And that was way back in 2019, I met them. And they were looking to set up their British centre of operations. And they could have gone to London, they could have gone to Sheffield, Belfast, anywhere. And we persuaded them to come here. And part of what it was, was a conversation I had with them, which was, well, what are you actually looking for? And they said, a loyal workforce. Because no employer wants to be recruiting people who leave and recruiting people who leave. Um, and I said, well, we can do that. The workforce in the Northeast is very, very loyal. What are you offering in return? Because I want to know, if we're going to do some co-investment with you, that you're going to look after people. And that pushback impressed them because then they knew I was serious. And that answer that came back was, we started on the shop floor and we've worked our way up. We look after people. We want a long-term future for people. There's now over 600 people work there. That's the sort of difference it made. And we are now a national leader on investment with big digital companies like ThoughtWorks, Credera, Version 1, Explore, Monster Labs, loads of them coming in. Some of these companies paying an average salary, an average salary of 54,000, which is not bad for the Northeast. So that's making a big difference. And we, last year, were the number one region for inward investment in the whole of Britain outstripping London, not on a massive basis because our population is about a tenth of that of London, um, but on a per capita basis four times higher than London and on a, an absolute basis higher than any other region in the country. So we're doing well. And can I work with central government? Well, the Northumberland line is being opened and there's been people trying to open that for a long time. It's not just me, it's a whole collaborative effort, but there was a point when central government was challenging that and they were saying the costs are too high, you're going to have to take out that station there. You can only run one train an hour. And some of you might remember that story made it in the press. So because of the collaborative working I'd done, I texted the Secretary of State for Transport, had a brief conversation, he says, right, speak to the Rail Minister. Um, had the meeting with the Rail Minister the next day. So it can't be true, is it? You're not going to run this on one train an hour, the service won't work. So, well, well, you've got to understand where the costs come from. We had a bit of a chat and I said, I would love to be in a position where I can say that I spent some time with you and you've decided that we're important enough to invest with a decent train service because that's a story everybody wants. And that's the position we agreed, that works order's been signed and that train line will be opened in December next year. When was the last time a train line was opened? We are capable of doing things in this country if we can get on with it. So that's my approach. Now, levelling up. Um, I could spend all night telling you about the problems that we've got in our region with child poverty, with the worst health inequality of any region, with the lowest investment in things like transport, although we are turning that around. 
with the lowest rate of business startups. I could talk about all the things that you know need to happen, but you know that. Otherwise, you wouldn't have turned up tonight. So I'll save you some time there. And I could spend some time telling you about how this government has failed on so many levels. Um, I've been mayor for three and a half years. Do you know how many prime ministers have been <laughs> through that time? I've worked with seven different local government ministers. As soon as I get somewhere with someone, they get outlasted by a lettuce. You know, it's, it's really hard work, but we're doing it. But rather than go on about the government, which is an open goal, I'll quote the philosopher Paul Weller, who some of you might know. Time is short, life is cruel, but it's up to us to change this town called Malice. So that's what it's about, what we're going to do. So I'll tell you the journey that we've been on through the North of Time Combined Authority. Day one I came in and there were literally more camera crew than staff. And there was a documentary crew filming the camera crew, filming me. And it got really quite surreal at one point. And they did this thing for the cameras where we're all in the boardroom there in our temporary office accommodation. Um, and um, it was, I introduced myself to the staff, said, we've got work to do, big round of applause. The cameras went. And then all the staff went. I said, well, where are you all going? They said, oh, they don't work here. We bust them in from the local authorities. So it looked busy on the first day. <laughs> and I had three permanent members of staff. And so my first month was basically reading CVs to try and recruit the team. By the time I got my senior management team in place, these are people on three months notice periods, it was January. And then we had a couple of months of clear work and we're hit with what? The global pandemic, which is everybody go home. And by the way, if you've never used Zoom, you better learn fast. In that period of time, what have we done? Let's run through some of it. One of the things I wanted to do was to give powers directly back to communities. So we set up something that we call Crowdfund North of Time. And this is where it's a nice, simple, easy process that if you have an idea that you think your community will back, you create the framework of it, you put it on the website, you spread it on your own social media, knock on doors, however you want to do it. And if you get enough people both signing up and giving moral support and enough small donations to get it part of the way towards your funding total, we'll put in the rest. And right here in Hexham, one of the projects is Grow Hexham. So I don't know if anybody's involved with it. Um, but there's a lot of people have gardens that they don't have the time or the inclination, or sometimes, you know, they may have lost mobility over the years, the ability to, to dig and be full of weeds or whatever else it might be. And there's a lot of other people who want to do some gardening. So people who are on the waiting list for the allotments get the chance to go and garden someone else's garden, and we support them with tools, and they share the produce. Now, isn't that a fantastic model of community cohesion? And we put the money in to make that happen. And there's others in Holt, Holt Whistle and things like that, but I'll, I'll rush through this for time reason. What else have we done? We've um, held our Equalities Assembly, and that was where there's real barriers to employment for people. And some of them are what we call protected characteristics. Yes, we can, we can identify if it's somebody's race um, or um, ethnicity or disability or something like that. But it's often very, very complex for people. It may be immigration status. It may be a mental health issue. It may be that somebody has neurodiversity in some way, whether that's dyslexia or, or any of a, of a whole range of other conditions. <laughs> so by getting people together, we co-design and use their lived experience. Because there's no use someone like me thinking how I would get a job. I had a successful career running a business and as an engineer and as a software developer. I've got to see it from the perspective of the people who really need help and listen to them. So we do that, and we've done that. And one of the, the best things that came out of that was people saying, actually, caring responsibilities. We have full-time jobs, and we have part-time jobs. Why, in a day of Zoom, can we not have school-time jobs? So do people doing the equivalent of working three days, but spread over five days? I think, I think well, that's such a good advice. Yeah, let's see what we can do about it on housing and affordable housing in particular um, i don't have the powers uh, i don't have planning powers I don't have the powers to regulate the private rented sector which i think is necessary there's some great private landlords but there are a lot who aren't but what we do have what i managed to get out of government is 24 million pounds for what's called brownfield housing and this is land that is basically it's not viable for people to build on 
because it may have contamination. If there was a former uh, factory there, the, the ground has got lead in it, it needs decontaminating. You can't have kids playing in the back garden, people growing veg. So we make the money available, but then we say to the developers, you are limited on the profits and you've got to include a certain amount of affordable housing. And so one of the ones, not in Hexham Town, but in Hexham constituency up at Bellingham, is Bellingham Mart. 63 houses being built there, or a mixture of bungalows and houses and other uh, forms of housing, uh, which is for all affordable. And that's a mixture of um, buy to rent to buy, um, shared ownership and direct rent. And we've done that in conjunction with Carbon Homes. So we're doing things there. Um, Educo is a cooperative teacher's supply agency. When you hear the words zero hours workers, whose mind immediately goes to teachers? It's not what we think, is it? We think of people riding on bikes delivering food. But supply teachers are zero hours workers, and it means they miss out on their pensions, and they miss out on continuing professional development. And frequently the schools are charging, or the, the agencies are charging the schools £250 a day. Guess how much the teachers get? 98. There's a big gap there. So the teaching unions approached me with this idea. We worked together, worked it up. We funded the business case development, the business plan. That cooperative now exists. There's, it's being led by supply teachers. And that cooperative will be trading in the next calendar year. And we'll be supporting them with what they need to get over the line on that basis. So they will then get their pensions. They'll get continuing professional development, better teacher deal for the kids, better deal for the teachers, better deal for the schools. So uh, we're running our child poverty prevention program. It's happening in Hexham Middle School and um, uh, Queen Elizabeth High School. And there's a whole range of things. Not all of this is happening in every school. But some of it is about intergenerational cooking. So often people who are struggling on a budget, it's because their numeracy isn't great. And that's a terrible thing to admit. But if you do it as a, well, let's do some intergenerational cooking, you know, grandma can come along with the kids and, and dad and whoever else, and we give them a slow cooker and they practice, but then they're learning weights and measures. And one of the things that really helps is then the parents and the, the grandparents have a bit of confidence to help the kids with the homework. Because I don't know about you, but the way they teach maths keeps changing. Um, so if anyone's actually tried helping their kids, it's, and they'll say, that's not the way I learned it. Um, and I've got a degree in engineering, I'm good at maths, but still. Um, and then there's things like um, helping with school uniform policy because a lot of schools, perhaps with the best of intention, have done things like get the kids to embroider their names on. Well, that means you can't hand it on or to a younger sibling and things like that. So it's just things like that, helping with um, after school activities to make them affordable. So that's one of the things we're doing there. And then working with the employers and working to give people welfare advice so they can get the benefits which they're entitled to. But anyone who's tried using universal credit will know it is extremely complex and a lot of people miss out. So we've got our good work pledge. And one of the things I'm really looking forward to when, and I appreciate not everybody here is a member of the Labour Party, but when we get that next Labour government, we've got the employment rights green paper ready to go, which will give people full employment rights from day one. And I think that's massive. And, and regardless of differences of opinions on what we think uh, many of us perhaps would like the bolder policy offer, but that is brilliant. It really is. And um, in the meantime, we've got our good work pledge. And that requires employers to pay the real living wage. It requires them to listen to their workforce. That includes trade union recognition. It requires them to have skills and development programmes so that a job becomes a career. It requires them to build a diverse workforce and it requires them to engage for community benefit. And if an employer can do two out of them, they sign up for a basic accreditation. If they do all five, they get advanced accreditation. That now covers 57,000 workers in our area. That's a big deal because the real living wage, extra 20 quid a week, that's an extra thousand pound a year. Now that makes a real big difference right now. The Union Learn projects, the Conservative government cut that. That was a project where there was a network in organisations of union learn reps so that people, typically it was people with, with unskilled work, could be identified. Here's a training course you can go on that will let you get a promotion and earn more money. And actually employers love that. 
and it, the economic calculation was done. For every pound spent on it, it returned £32 in economic impact. Yet it was cut. So we've restored it. And that's now stronger than it was before. It's one of the few places in the country where that project still runs. On the offshore industry, <laughs> now we're talking about big investments here, £25 million, pounds, to increase the number of jobs, to increase the, the rate of investment in our offshore industry with firms like Transmission Dynamics in Cramlington, where as a result of our investment, they now have a new factory where they are making um, sensors that are remote control. Because if you think about wind turbines on the North Sea, it's a pretty rough area of sea. If you've got to go out and measure things, it's both expensive and dangerous. These things have the telemetry on it and it can give the engineers real-time data on how they're performing, how the structures are bending with the wind, which increases their lifespan and over time reduces the cost of offshore wind investment. And uh, the, the Swan Hunter site, which many of you will be aware of, closed in the early 2000s, iconic for our region. That's cleared. We're investing it. We're in discussions with someone coming in there to be building components for offshore wind. And that's going to be a fantastic day when we see engineers working back on that site again. So uh, what else have we done? On the rural economy, um, we have a rural growth fund and um, Red Engineering nearby have benefited from that with um, £150,000 investment, which is going to increase their turnover, three quarters of a million a year, six new staff there. We've invested in the Newcastle United Foundation. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a Newcastle supporter. Um, and uh, as, as we move to a larger region, I've got to be very careful to say that because a lot of Sunderland support <laughs> south of the river. But this is a project. Now, we put the anchor funding in. They've been trying to get this off the ground for years. Because we put money in, then Newcastle Building Society did and the Premier League did, and it got it over the line. And this project helps tens of thousands of kids every year and young adults who've struggled with their education, have had a bad result. Perhaps bad family circumstances, uh, for a whole range of reasons. But these kids are getting the confidence, they're getting the qualifications. And I have had conversations with people where they've said, look, I couldn't leave the house. And as a result of this sort of support, they've gone on and they've got jobs, they've got the confidence, they've gone off and got degrees and they've come back because we should not write people off based on their current circumstances. That's the sort of thing that makes a difference. Helping the culture and creative sector around here. All the, 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 who's seen the illuminated sheep? Um, so we, we funded that. I can't claim it was my idea. That's, that's what we do. We get good ideas from other people, but we make them enable. We enable them. And the, um, the Hadrian's Wall 1900 celebrations, we supported that. The community hubs, uh, Holt Whistle, um, that we've put up, and there's others around the region. Um, the Carers to Work programme. Often, when someone has stopped caring, it's sadly because the person they've been looking for looking after has died. And it may be some years since they worked, probably pre-pandemic. And then you've got to go and get an interview on Zoom. Now, your confidence is low. Let's be honest, the Department of Work and Pensions, the job centres, are not normally the most sympathetic and supportive of people. And people are getting thrown into that grinder. And they're getting sanctioned. So we support them with one-on-one -on -one coaching, with kindness, to help people get it. And it's making a difference. And people are getting employed and earning more money as a result. And there's a, a whole range of programmes. Well, just talk about the skills. We got the adult education budget devolved on the 1st of August 2020. Can you imagine a worse time? We didn't even know if the colleges were going to be open in the September. How are you supposed to plan for that? Despite that, my team, my brilliant team, increased enrolments in that first year by 10%. The number of people who had no qualifications in the north of Tyne area dropped from 7.1% to 6% in a year. That's remarkable. And last year, we've had our second year's figures through, enrolments are now, I'll round it up, 33,000 on a course we funded last year, which is an increase of 12,000 from the year before because we've been able to leave extra money out of central government and we're now delivering flexible courses called boot camps, which can be up to 16 weeks, but people can work that around part-time working commitments, around caring responsibilities, because often the biggest barrier is when you say, right, you've got to go full-time to college to get new skills, and people say, well, how can I do that? You know, I've got kids or I'm working or whatever else it is. So it's making a big difference. And of them, by the way, 
45% came from people living in our most deprived wards, 70% were unemployed, 57% were women, 57% had low or no qualifications, 45% were from non-white communities, and 20% were from people with a learning difficulty or a disability. So we're really helping the people who need the most help. And those are real people, not just statistics. So I'll tell you the story of Jimmy, who'd been unemployed for 10 years. And once you're out of the jobs market, it's a catch-22. If you've got a big gap on your CV, employers are a bit reluctant to engage with you. The chance of even getting an interview is quite low. So Jimmy engaged with the Cedarwood Trust, an organisation that we support. And they built out a kitchen. It's a, 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 an area not dissimilar to this room, perhaps. But they built it so it looks like a professional kitchen. I was talking to Wayne, who runs it. He says, we wanted it to look like a real place because often the people who come in here, they feel that they don't belong in a nice place. They are intimidated by it. So we made it look like a real professional kitchen. And Jimmy engaged on a, a bunch of courses with them. In June this year, he got a job in catering, his first job for a decade, and it's turned his life around. And he's got money in his pocket. And he's paying tax. I mean, isn't that, that the holy grail of what we want? An economy that works. And I could tell you so many other stories. But jobs is the number one target I have from central government. When the combined authority was set up, it was given a target to create 10,000 jobs over 30 years. But you hear a lot of stories about how many tens of thousands of jobs are created. For ours, the real. To count, it has to be a full-time job or equivalent, two or three part-time jobs, but full-time hours. A full-time job held by someone for over a year, which is a direct consequence of the investment we put in. So none of this multiplier effects. You know, well, if you, if you create a business park, someone moves in, then the people where they spend their money, that will create more restaurant jobs. None of that. Actual jobs with identifiable people. So that target of 10,000 jobs, by now should be on about 1,100 jobs after three and a half years. We're on 4,585 jobs. That's 14 years progress in three and a half years from a standing start through a pandemic and we've safeguarded another 2,700. For every pound I spend, it returns more than three pounds to Treasury in the payroll taxes alone, the PAYE and the national insurance. So if anybody ever tells you that the Labour Party doesn't know how to run an economy, you send them to me. So what next? Well, there's going to be announced on Thursday Austerity 2.0. Austerity doesn't work, by the way. Um, anybody who's followed the news for the last 12 years will have heard the government saying, we're going to cut budgets and because we're going to repair the public finances. And two years later, they say, oh, growth wasn't as good as it was, so we're going to cut budgets further. And um, we then find widening health inequalities. So sickness rates go up. And we find people less skilled. Every employer I talk to, nobody has ever said, I'm not investing because I'll have to pay tax if I'm successful. What every employer, pretty much every employer tells me is, I can't find enough skilled people because we're not investing enough in education and in the transport that we need. So I'm in the middle of negotiating, actually at a very advanced stage of negotiating, another devolution deal that will bring our region together, that will bring Gateshead and South Tyneside and Sunderland and hopefully County Durham. County Durham wants to come in. We've a little bit of work to do to persuade some of the others to let Durham in, which is a little bit ironic, um, but there we are. Um, central government, I was talking to Michael Gove earlier about this before I came here today. And that's a deal that will bring us over £3 billion of investment into the region, which we sorely need. It's also, by the way, the highest per capita devolution deal anywhere in the country. And uh, if we do bring Durham in, the highest in absolute terms. And not that I'm competitive, but 60% more per person than Greater Manchester. And um, Andy yeah. Burnham is a good mate of mine. We ran the Great North Front together, and I love him a bit. But don't they get too much attention? Shouldn't we get a bit more? Um, so I'm very keen on that. And we're working on things like fiscal devolution, like a regional wealth fund, which is written into that deal, which gives us the capacity to borrow a base rate to make finance available for small firms. And we're doing a lot of that already. Coming online next year, 
is we haven't quite worked out what we're going to budget as, but basically it's a, uh, an investment fund which we put £10 million into and I've persuaded others, so the universities are putting some in, and this will grow over time to become a £100 million investment fund directly to take shares and equity investments in businesses in our region, startups and scale-ups. So they've got the money to grow, but we get the money back so we can spend it again. Isn't that got to be a bit better? than these things being owned by hedge funds who are based in tax havens. And on transport, well, we've done a lot. I had agreed before COVID with the bus companies. So this thing about joint ticketing, I mean, you all know this, anyone who uses the bus uh, along the Tyne Valley and the Tyne side, <coughs> that if you get a bus, a ticket, a return ticket from one bus company, you can't use it on the other. And it's infuriating. Um, and the unreliability is an issue. So I'd, I'd got down with, together with the bus companies and we'd agreed to do a trial about joint ticketing and then COVID hit. And then the, bus, the nature of the bus funding changed. So I negotiated with the government, we got something called the, the BSIP money, don't worry too much about the technicalities. Um, but that's where we were the most successful area in the country in terms of funding, which is now allowing us, as of um, the start of next year, across the whole Northeast transport area, from Berwick all the way to Barnard Castle. For anyone under 22 to have a one pound fare, regardless of the distance they're traveling. And if you're someone who needs to get somewhere for your education or wants to take a job, and you know, let's be honest, a lot of young people don't have cars or, or don't have well-paid jobs, that is life-changing. So that's the sort of thing we're doing already. But what I really want is what I call rock-up transport. Because yeah, these, these fares are great. But it's not much good if there isn't a bus. Or if you're trying to use the Northern service, and I think it's about 39% of them are cancelled. Um, and I'm, I don't own a car anymore. I've borrowed a car to get here tonight because otherwise I would have risked not being here because I couldn't plan in advance whether that train would be cancelled. And I can't turn up an hour late and say, thanks for waiting, everyone. You wouldn't have been here. So what we're fighting for, and what I've got agreed, and I got it agreed in the budget in March 2020. I was in, I was in Sajid Javid's office when he was Chancellor. That tells you how long ago it was. <laughs> There's been a few of them since then, hasn't it? Um, but we got it agreed because they were going to give this city regional sustainable transport settlement to the other mayoral combined authorities. And we were going to miss out because we don't have transport and I understand the government's position on that. But I said, look, give us it and I'll bring the region together. And that's where we are. And we're that close from getting it. And it's been negotiated. That's 147 million of new money over and above existing money for just this comprehensive spending review period alone, just the next few years. And then you renegotiate it on an ongoing basis after that. And that will give us the powers we need to really make a difference with rock up transport. And that's where you get one of these things and you get an app on it. And whatever you want to do, it'll tell you the best options. So or I want to drive to a park and ride. Right, boom, book your place, place, so you're there. Or if you want to park in town somewhere, because for whatever, you might be carrying something heavy and you can't, right, that's your place, your place book. But, you know, by the way, have you realised that you could get on the train or on the bus, and it'll be the same ticketing all the way through? And it'll make it quicker, because you might be there handing cash over the driver. Boom, it'll just take it off it. And we'll do it, because not everyone has a smartphone, in a way that you can do it with a debit card. And that's the sort of thing that makes a difference. And as you get more people onto public transport, not so much in the rural areas, but certainly in the urban areas, it has a snowball effect because more money comes into it and you can provide a better service. And then you can use cross subsidies to really help the rural areas. So that's the way that we make it financially sustainable. And what do we need to do? We need to ultimately level up. Now, what does that mean? Who knows? But I'll tell you what I think it means. Leveling up is about making sure that everybody has the life chances they need. So that if you've had a bad start in life, you're going to get the education you need. If your health has gone, perhaps through no fault of your own, perhaps because you haven't looked after yourself, but we'll find a way to make sure that your health is better. And it's this virtuous circle. Because as you get more people into well-paid jobs, there's less pressure on the public services and there's more opportunity to give people the higher quality of service they need and if you have better transport that funds economic growth and if that economic growth is green and sustainable that's better for our planet and we've got a chance of surviving the climate emergency 
All right, you've got to do that internationally. I can't promise that. But that's the vision we need. Everybody in a decent, well-paid job. And what would do that do for our region? And the more we have that, the stronger culture we can have, and the more money people will have to use our cultural services. The better housing we can build. And the more we invest with foresight, the less we will regret with hindsight. I was at the Remembrance Day, Day Parade yesterday um, in Newcastle, and um, I actually really like the hymn, Jerusalem. Um, and I probably shouldn't say this in a church, I'm not particularly religious, um, but I, I think it's a, a real call to arms. You know, I will not cease from mental fight. I'm trying to build a new Jerusalem, that, that message of it, and I think that's really powerful. And I think, if we can get the powers we need, if we can start to get some fiscal devolution where we're in control of this, where we're not taxing our own people, but we're in control of our own economic destiny, we can do that version of building a prosperous northeast that's zero carbon and zero poverty, which gives everybody the life chances they should have. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was, that's certainly given us a lot to think about. And um, there's probably lots of questions going to come. Um, Jamie, first, he, he latterly talked about transport. And I know we have a question from Malcolm Cheney of the Tyne Valley Community Rail Partnership on that very topic. So, Malcolm, perhaps you'd like to kick off the question section. Um, we'll, take, we'll take this question and then... The rest of the time, um, I'd like to take three questions at a time, uh, and Jamie will speak to those questions. I think it's, a, it's a, a fairer way to give everybody a chance of having their question heard and discussed. So that's what we'll do following Malcolm's question. I, I think you probably need to speak up yeah, a little, Malcolm, as well. Um, very laudable that you don't have a car um, in Newcastle, I assume. Um, but this is excellent, and this is good now. It's not as hard as it is. Um, now, the other combined authorities that I know of, uh, including the Greater Manchester, are centred on big cities. They don't mm -hmm. have a lot of rural hinterland. We do. Um, and particularly if you live north or south. Uh, Hexton, there are bus services uh, and it's very difficult for people. They either have to run cars they can't afford uh, or they can't get to jobs, hospitals, schools, whatever it is that they need to do. Uh, we have a big tourist attraction in the shape of Cadre's Wall, very nice that it's celebrating a big birthday, <coughs> but we need to get people to it um, and we prefer letting them drive. The National Park has a policy. Uh, of trying to persuade people not having to drive. So my question is, how can you square that circle? Um, how can you get buses and trains to link up? Uh, I guess the trains aren't great. There's been derailment in Carlisle, which means they stop at Hull Whistle. Um, the replacement buses don't link up with the trains, let alone the, the commercial buses. This is all kind of the bread and butter stuff that we need to address. Um, how will you do it? Malcolm, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, how do you link it all together? Uh, I would imagine most people here do remember a time when the buses were regulated. And then they were deregulated at, I think it was in the mid-1980s. Um, I, I can't remember the exact time, but I remember, as a kid, I grew up in Middlesbrough, I remember um, that the buses, um, they used to chase each other and try and race each other to pick up the passengers. And that still goes on now. And it's crazy, um, because it serves nobody's interest. It doesn't even serve their long-term interests either, by the way, because all it does is a few people use the buses. And if you look at a graph of this, it goes down and down and down every year in the northeast since the time of deregulation, in terms of bus patronage. If you look at London, it goes up every year, because they've had funded from central government. By the way, funded from central government, means funded by us because it's our money. You know, this is not some great philanthropist. It's not Rishi giving us like some share of his 300 million that he's got in his back pocket for this. This is our tax money. 
and it's how we join that together. Now, the point of saying I don't have a car is not um, for any other reason that say, the reason I use public transport is so I get it, so I use it and I experience it. Whereas, I'll tell you actually, sorry, a little anecdote for me. Um, we've built something called the Great Wall of Scotswood. So this is for affordable housing. Some of you might remember the old terraces in Hot Scotswood that went down towards the river. Very, very steep. And they couldn't really build good quality housing on that. Um, so it's been levelled, but it needs a massive retailing, retaining wall. And there's a whole estate being built with heat exchanges, um, which will keep people's bills lower and is low carbon heating. Um, and I was going to see this, and it was a building site, and my um, PA was talking to the, the building company and said, we've got a, a space for the mayor's limo um, where we can park it, and um, the tyres will be fine because no screws around, and they'll clean it. And he said, that's very, very kind. Is there somewhere he can chain his bike? Um, <laughs> So the process of getting transport devolved is basically the first step. And that's where I put in my manifesto, because I knew that. Because if you don't have any legal powers to do this, you're relying on asking people nicely. Now, all right, I've got a, perhaps a louder voice now I'm the mayor than before I was the mayor. But does anyone really think that the private bus companies are going to do this out of largesse out of the goodness of their hearts. No, they're not. So the process is to get that transport powers devolved to the authority. That required bringing in the south of the river. And that's happened. And just, yeah, just, um, just while I'm answering the question. Sorry. Um, and that comes with £147 million worth of new money. And that process of getting them all together, like I say, on a single app. Now that is as valuable in a rural, in fact it's much more valuable in the rural area. And one of the things we need to do is what's called on-demand transport. Because the reality is, you're not going to be running a bus every half hour through every village. There's two reasons for that. One, if you do, the bus will take forever to get anywhere. And two, most of the time, it'll be going down a country lane with not many people on it. What you want is the bus when you want it. Now, you can kind of do that if you've got deep pockets and can ring a taxi, but it's too expensive. And actually, it's not that great for the environment anyway, typically. But if you, and this happens in, in lots of other places in Europe, which is where we're taking the pattern from, um, you can have now the software that develops it where people can say, I want to go then. Now, it might be more reliable if you book it a little bit in advance. If you say, you know what, I want to go to the doctors, I want to go, I don't know, I want to go to Hadrian's Wall, as you say. Um, I want to go and do me shopping. Um, basic things like that. Then you can have that on-demand transport. And that is in the North East Transport Plan. Um, and when we get the, the cash to do it. Um, it means better park and ride facilities for people. And it means so that, I mean, uh, bus stops that are actually quite nice to be in is a good thing as well. So that you're not standing there. I and mean, let's be honest, global warming or not, Northumberland is not always the warmest and driest place to stand outside, is it? So a bit better on the, the, the bus stop infrastructure. So that's the routes through, and that means regulation of the Northern Rail Service to come in with it, to integrate in the Tyne and Weir metro system, to increase more of these lines, like the Northumberland line that we're opening from Ashington through Blythe, that integrates with the metro at um, North Tyneside and Northumberland Park, and goes into Manners and Central St Station, um, and others that we want to do, like the Weir side loop, because then, people can get across the region because it's all right it's good if you can get from here into Tyneside in Newcastle but not everything is in Newcastle you want to be able to get across you might have family and friends or work all over the place so it's about getting that network built up so that's the process we're on it we're making real progress um, but every time like I say I find it, it might just get there with a new minister they resign or get sacked or caught in a scandal and I've got to start working with another one so it's, uh, it's not easy. Thank you, Jamie. Right, uh, any further, more, more questions, please? Um, yes, the lady there. Hello, Jamie. It's nice to meet you. Thank you for coming along. I think everybody can hear me okay, can they? No. Nice afternoon. Hello. Here's the mic. Is that better? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, it's really interesting to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Um, you talked about the child poverty strategy. I actually run the local food bank. I think you met my daughter the other week. Rose's corner, yeah. <laughs> I thought you'd recognise me. <laughs> Very similar. Now, 
when he summarised your vision for levelling up at the end, you mentioned combat and poverty. Mm. He spoke a bit about the child poverty strategy. I'm really keen to know where you're at with the Poverty Truth Commission mm. and where it fits in to the strategy on the levelling up agenda. Thank you. Are we taking a few? Um, yep. Um, another question here. Penny. Thank you very much. Um, this is sort of our line. So I work with the Real Living Wage Group in Hexham, and we've been um, quite successful in getting um, North London <coughs> County Council to pass increased funding in care homes to workers so that they are getting a real living wage. But I think it's become clear to us that there are big issues around procurement and making companies that we work with actually treat their staff properly and pay them properly. So I know that you have the uh, good work bench. Um, just so I'm wondering if you could comment on the scope of being able to do what I've just described. Yeah. Thank you. And we have a, a question from Jim Robinson, Robertson, um, just third row back. Thanks very much for your presentation there, Jimmy. And I think my question is that for me there's a confusion if we're thinking of levelling up between the principles of community wealth building and what can be called pragmatic incrementalism. And I think what we've heard this evening from you has been, for me, pragmatic incrementalism and not something about community wealth building. And that's in a context at present where I never dreamt I would experience this, that life expectancy in the North East is going down. Uh, illness is coming, what, six or seven years earlier for even those of us who broadly are, 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 are well. And there's no sense in, for me that the pragmatic incrementalism is likely to to work. So I, my question is in a very unfair, unequal northeast. What are the real challenges that need to be faced politically? And how do we re-educate ourselves to think about the common good, which might lead to uh, levelling up? Otherwise, for me, it's just odd incrementalism. Right. Thank you. Um, sorry, I didn't get your name. Sam. Sam. So, Sam, um, uh, Child Poverty and the Poverty Truth Commission. So, for the benefit of everybody else, we are running what's called a Poverty Truth Commission, where we... So, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so, we're running a Poverty Truth Commission which is hearing the lived experience, the stories of people about what is actually the barrier and why they're in poverty. Um, the media, that, that's a blanket term, but let's say large sections of the media like to portray poverty from a certain perspective. And one of the stories that I heard was a woman who, um, they had, I think she had four kids, and her husband had a good job and for reasons that we'll not go into that were no fault of hers she suddenly found herself financially responsible for the kids and she went through the actual effects of her budget and because there's a two child limit on the universal credit for example um, because she has to pay for childcare if she takes more hours because if she hits a certain threshold of earnings she loses the free school meals that she showed that if she works eight hours a week, she had 60 quid a month left over for everything after she paid essentials. Now, you can't take your kids on holiday for 60 quid. And if she worked 15 hours, she showed the calculations and it was 60 quid a month. And it was only when she got to full time, but that had a problem because she had young kids, some of whom were, were as low as two and the others were school age. So that's the sort of process, and there's any number of things, and it's that understanding that informs us on policy development. Because what we do with everything we can is co-design it, and where possible, co-produce it. That's not always possible, because sometimes people don't have the capacity to do it. But the combined authority isn't me sitting there in my office being clever and working out the solutions. 
It's me talking to people who know what they're doing, developing a fantastic officer team that makes things happen, and using my gentle arm twisting skills to get the people with the money to help fund it. And we've levered in hundreds of millions of pounds to support things. We're in the process of levering in billions. I'll, you know, I'll don't announce it till it's signed off. Um, so that's some of the things we're doing. And then the child poverty prevention programme that's going on in the schools. Well, that's three main pillars. One is about poverty proofing the school day. And that's why I was talking about uniforms. But it could also be the trips, so that kids aren't excluded. And then the second pillar is help um, with help at the school gates, so that parents or carers do get that welfare advice so they can have uh, the benefits to which they are entitled. And then it's working with employers because they might not be aware of what they're doing that is adding extra financial costs to families. Um, and that could be anything from, do you realise that by starting it just then, and if you just change your hours, they could get a bus in instead of having to get a taxi in. And that would make it so much cheaper for people. So it's those sorts of things that make a difference on that. Um, Penny, you're asking about the real living wage. Um, so the obviously there's a good work pledge, which I spoke about, but then there's the anchor programme. And this is work that we funded with CLES, the Centre for Local Economic Strategies, to work with the local authorities, to work with the NHS, to work with the universities, to come together to try and build a regional framework for procurement. Um, and the team came up with a name, which isn't the catchiest name, but it actually encompasses it quite well, the way we do things around here, which is the way we procure. So at the north of time, the standard thing is that there's a legal requirement to procure, unless you can make a case to directly commission. But you have a choice about how you make that decision. And typically, people put it on price. Now, you can put a ceiling on the price anyway, and then you can procure on quality and social impact. And you can give people more points if they are looking after their workforce. And if you're the public sector, whether it's the NHS, whether it's a local council, if you have people earning more money, over time, you actually have to spend less. Because, all right, if we take out smoking, by far the single biggest determinant of your health is how much money you've got. It's not even how much exercise you do, it's how much money you've got. And I appreciate that fit goes into lots of other lifestyle issues. So that's what we do. That, we just started that and then pandemic came along and we decided that, you know what, the NHS probably wasn't going to engage with us in the middle of the pandemic. So we waited for that that way and started up again. Um, and um, uh, Jim, community wealth building. There's, um, th there was a lot in your question there. Um, so, pragmatic incrementalism, absolutely. Done is better than perfect. So we need stuff to happen now. But that's the foundations of a lot of this stuff. So there's, there's actually there's five pillars on community wealth building, but there's a number that we're doing, for example, the use of land. Well, that's what we're doing around the brownfield housing and things like that. But I'm engaged with central government, and I'm leading the way on this for all the mayors, on what's called land value capture. So for example, when we put in a new railway line, or a new metro line, wherever it might be, or for that matter, a new park, but the value of the land around it goes up. And who benefits? Well, typically wealthy landowners. If it's, if it's clean greenfield site, we've been land banking. Sometimes it might be existing landowners, householders, who will benefit eventually down the line when they sell their house. If we had a change in the law, and you could just tack this onto a finance bill, it'd be quite easy for government to do, then when you put in that new infrastructure, all of that wealth, you could say, well, we'll take 90% of the windfall. No one's out of pocket. And you do a proper survey and you say, you know, this shop, wherever it might be, this hotel was worth £200,000 as a result of this, now worth £280,000. Well, great. Well, we'll take £73,000. But only when you sell it. So no one's out of pocket. They get the immunity. Their business is more successful in the meantime. But I can then borrow against that and instead of waiting 15 years to get a public transport scheme built, we can just crack on with it. And I've been talking about that to central government. I propose that to all the, the metro mayors. It's now the policy of transport for the north. And I was, I've had conversations with Treasury Ministers, and I was talking to Michael Grove earlier today again, saying about 
uh, we've got the best deal on the stocks that anyone's got, but I'm still trying to make it better because, I, you know, that's where I'm like. Um, and, um, and I said, Michael, you said previously you'd help me broker a conversation with the Treasury on this. I used to look for that, and he said, absolutely. So that's the sort of thing that really makes a big deal. And now community wealth building, I could talk for hours on this, and I regularly have, um, but for, for the interest of time, that's one of the things. Now, the real challenge is, which is perhaps the second part of your question, top and bottom of it is wealth extraction. Huge amounts of what we think is ours isn't. Now, interest is one of the most obvious things. Interest is a way of transferring money from poor people to rich people. Because if you already have money, you can say, there you are, um, you can buy your house, um, the shareholders eventually of the Barclays Bank, whoever else it might be, but you've got to pay me back a lot more in the end. And for so many people, they're running at standstill. And now for so many people, they're running hard as they can, but still going backwards. And that's one of the things. So the things we've done that really make a difference is our finance fund that's going to be supporting regional, small and local enterprises, spin-ups and startups. Now that makes a big difference because that money stays here and it comes back to us to respend. And we're going to be we, in the process, it's already been signed off, we're going through the process of developing a similar one for social enterprises and cooperatives. That's fantastic. You have a social enterprise and you can get patient capital. Because you try to get a venture capitalist for something like that, it doesn't work. The legal structure of a co-op, it doesn't work. But we'll put the patient capital in. And we're already doing that, actually, in the culture and creative funds, a number of things that we've already got up there. So that's the things that really make a difference. Now, long term, it's health, it's education, it's better transport, it's better housing. What's really going to make a difference? Change of government. Yes. I'm doing my best. <laughs> Right, further questions? Yes, um, and then yourself. Hi, Jenny, thank you very much for that. That was fantastic. You were talking about the investment coming into the North Face, which is fantastic. Could you please hold the microphone next to yours? Sorry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. I'm very confused with this morning, I think it was, that the British home factory at Blythe is on the verge of collapse. Yeah. What's exactly happening with that? Please. Okay, and uh, the gentleman in on, uh, on the third row here, yes. Thank you, Ian Richardson. Uh, a couple of questions for building on that. One is, can you say anything about Nico, which had a regional for building coalitions for the climate crisis, and the other probably adjacent to that is the creation of microgrids to democratise the Any further questions? Oh, right. um, yeah, that's really me. Um, it's a general question, really, not particularly related to this region, but you've just mentioned that you work with the Metro Mayors, and I'm just wondering about that group, uh, the relationships within those groups, how well it works, because obviously there's the Labour Conservatives. Do you feel you sometimes in competition? Is the tension there? Like there is, you know, you leave the politics behind and you just work for your regions. Um, do you think you're in competition? Um, there is a discrepancy between the way money is allocated to the different authorities. Just your mm. feelings about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, got British folk. Um, I know a lot more than I'm allowed to tell you, I'm afraid. Um, I'm sure everybody respects that. Um, so I first spoke to, actually it was Oral Najari when he was CEO, the day after it was announced they were coming here. Um, and that was in COVID and we had a, a very distanced conversation um, in his temporary office in Blythe. Um, and actually as an aside, right from the beginning I was saying, are you going to be a trade unionized plan? And they were saying no. Uh, we'll have a works council uh, and managed to persuade them to talk to Unite um, and I was saying look do you realize the Unite plant hasn't lost a day's production and they have a trade union because you just work problems out that's what trade unions are good at um, and then a few months later Peter Rolton the then CEO I brought a national journalist up who was driving us around the site in his very posh Range Rover um, and he was saying, oh, of course, um, we've got a, a deal with Unite for the, for the factory because, do you know, they've not lost a day's production at Nissan. 
Um, so there are things you can do, and I worked with Steve Kaysen to get the, um, the agreement for the construction uh, workers to be unionised as well. Now, if you think about something like building a gigafactory, it's not cheap. It requires hundreds of millions to even get a prototype. They had hoped to get the investment in from the market. Recent global financial conditions have not made that possible. I don't think I'm breaking any confidences in saying that. Um, and they've had an agreement, again, this is in the public domain, with central government for £100 million to buy kit once the factory was built, so that they then produce. Now, the problem with that is, of course, by the time you're at that stage, you don't really need the money because you have orders coming in. And so they've requested the central government to have an advance on some of that money for general business purposes, and they've done a deal with the financier to leave her in many times more than that amount, and that financier had promised government that they, if the factory didn't go ahead, they would repay that money. And I had a conversation with the now Secretary of State um, and some of his spads, um, and a number of other people tried, and they said no. And it's extremely short-sighted. Because if you look at how these industries are developing everywhere else, Northvolt in Sweden has 500 million euros of investment to get it over the line. Now, I'm not one who thinks we should be subsidising large corporations to take money out of the region. And there are ways you can do that. The government can invest and just take an equity share. It's easy enough. And then we're guaranteed our money back. And I think that's actually quite a good way of doing things. You know, perhaps many of us would like a totally different kind of economy. We've got to start from where we are. Um, and I think that's a very pragmatic and socially responsible way of doing it. Um, and British Vault did have, because we were working with them on it, a fantastic uh, ESG environment and social governance approach. Um, the reality is, um, I think unless um, something happens, I can't see it going ahead. Um, but I don't want to say anything that makes it worse for them. Um, so that, that is, 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 it, everything I've said is an honest answer, but it's as comprehensive an answer as I can give um, without breaking commercial confidentiality. Um, so Ian was asking about um, Nico. So that's the North East England Climate Coalition. What's it stand for? North East England Climate Coalition. Think, yeah, what's the O? Oh, CO for coalition. That's it. Um, so, um, this is going back a while. This is, must be August 2019 when I first met with um, the people who were behind it. And they had a plan for bringing local authorities together, the public sector, in a coalition. And that hit various political problems, which I'm not going to because I achieve as much as I do by trying to keep everybody on side. You, you get more with a win-win than you do by <coughs> knocking people down for their perhaps temporary mistakes. You're always trying to reverse them. But we got to the point where we have now launched today, and I was speaking out this morning, the Net Zero North East England Coalition, of which NICO was perhaps the, the genesis, the embryo. And that includes all of our local authorities, the, um, the officer team sits under the north of time, so I made finances available for that to happen. And it's got hundreds of businesses involved, um, the wider public sector, the NHS. And this is about sharing best practice and doing what we can to reduce emissions across the whole of the northeast. We've finally come there. Uh, it's taken a while, but it has happened. And it makes a difference. And that's from the tweet to the teams. Uh, that is from the LA7 area, so it doesn't include Tees Valley. Nico does, but this, um, this actually feeds into the next question actually, which was um, about the, um, the Metro Mayors. Um, some Metro Mayors work better together than others. Um, <laughs> mentioning no near neighbours. Um, when I uh, was elected, I became M9 which was the ninth Metro Mayor. Um, and it was all a bit James Bond because my first meeting of the M9 was in um, City Hall in London, which is Sadiq Khan's office building as the Mayor of London. And that's actually where they filmed the James Bond film. And some people might remember he gets thrown, not Bond, and the bad guy, uh, M, throws him off the stairs and he splats the, the, um, the Spectre agent. Um, and so it was, it was quite surreal turning up. And we've had a number of meetings since then. And in those days, there was four 
Tory mayors and five Labour mayors. And it was actually quite an insight because we were all, particularly through the pandemic, trying to get answers out of central government, trying to get them to do things on a much better test and trace model, trying to support our local authorities. Um, and at various times, actually trying to work with the Department of Education when Gavin Williamson, who wasn't Sir Gavin Williamson at that time, Gavin Williamson was the Secretary of State for Education. And what was really interesting was, I'll not name names, but one of the Tory mayors used some very post-watershed language uh, about the ministers and the department. Um, and the rest of us Labour mayors are thinking, well, we couldn't say that because it looked just like, like party sour grapes. But what the Tories are saying how bad they were at dealing with central government, you got an insight into it. Um, and um, Tim Bowles, who was the then Tory mayor for the West of England, um, I would chat and, and make friends with people. So you, if you make friends with people, they'll help you out. Um, and um, when one of the local government ministers, Simon Clark, resigned, suddenly Luke Hall. And I'd never heard of Luke Hall. So I'd look on the, the map. It turned out he was an MP in the West of England combined authority area. So I, I rang Tim up because I'd arranged with Simon Clark the next day he was coming to talk to us as a region about the next wave of devolution. I was like, it's taken me ages to set this up. I don't want to lose it. Found out who Luke Hall was, um, asked Tim to have a word with him, had a conversation with him beforehand, and uh, well, it was a Zoom conversation. He had that new dad look, you know, that what have I been thrown into here? I'm tired, I haven't had any chance to sleep. And said, so, look, this is what's going on, this is what we need in the region. And we had that route. So that collaborative approach makes a big difference. Um, are there rivalries? Friendly ones. Um, so um, when we were talking about the climate uh, emergency in the run-up to COP26, Steve Rotherham and I had a bidding war uh, about who was going to be the greenest region. Um, so that's just, you know, fun and banter. But actually we work remarkably cooperatively together. So the, the Leem side line, for example, some might have heard of it. If you try and get a train from Newcastle going south, or from the south up to Newcastle, between Northallerton and Newcastle, there are literally four bits of metal, two tracks, one south, one north, which means we're limited to six trains an hour, because if they get too close, it's not safe. But the bigger problem is you have high speed trains, the Zoomers, and then you have freight trains or cross country trains, or local commuter services. So we can't put any more services on. So there's an extra train that they wanted to put on to London because that deal was done ages ago when they thought the capacity was going to increase to seven trains now, and it's not uh, because the government didn't put the investment in. So they're taking off the trains that go to the northwest. So it's, it's just bad for the region, the wider region. And the answer to that is to reopen the lean sideline, which if you go back, 150 years, we had two separate sets of lines. If you go back to 1991, we had two separate sets of lines because that was the East Coast Main Line temporarily while we electrified the current East Coast Main Line. And that was on nobody's plans. Everyone said they wanted it to happen, but it wasn't anywhere because the integrated rail plan, which was going to produce Northern Powerhouse Rail, it was, that was the route through. But no one had, had, had found a way to do it. So what I did is I spoke to Dan Jarvis and Steve Rotherham and Andy Burnham um, and made sure in the upcoming Transport for the North meeting, which I set in the Transport for the North, we would get the Leam side line included for the first time ever in that government plan for funding. We're still going to get the funding, but the first stage is to get it in the plan as the preferred option. Um, and um, John Cridland, who's the chair, um, who's a bit of a Tory, um, but he um, was saying, because they were all saying, the Leam side, oh, this is an excellent idea, we should all support this, and he says, isn't it remarkable, this is the first time ever that I've heard mayors supporting a transport scheme that isn't from their area. <laughs> and so that little bit of back work about getting people together does help you deliver. And so is that coalition, because what we all want is proper devolution, so we can start making decisions that work for us, that don't depend on the good luck of a minister being in post long enough and having the right ideas and actually caring about our region. Yeah. Okay. More questions? Um, I, I've actually got a question that I'd like to ask you, Jamie. Um, you, you talked about the next stage of devolution. Um, where are we at on the, late, on the latest devolution deal? That's my question. Any, any more questions? Yep, gentlemen. 
Hi, uh, I was just wondering about a clarification point you made earlier about plan to like bring all under 22 uh, tickets down to a pound on the bus services. I just want to check whether that would be for all services um, over all companies because I go to college in Newcastle and there's been multiple times where I've been trying to get a bus home. I regularly use General T because I've got a one pound, one pound forty now for under 19s, and I've got on a same coach bus just because it's there when I'm there, and they only um, reduce the price for under 16s, so I've ended up being charged five quid when I could go on a North East bus for one pound forty. I feel like the disparity between those companies is just a disadvantage to everybody. No, I'm just wondering what you do to like combat that. Yeah. And my further, my further question on um, uh, devolution is, um, what do you think real devolution looks like? Ooh. <laughs> God, that's one of the most tempting questions I've been asked in a long, long time. Are we on camera? Um, uh, short answer, uh, where was the gentleman? Yes. Um, the short answer is um, yes, all services. Um, so that's good news for you. Uh, and you're dead right. I mean, it's just crazy that someone like you doing everything that you know, society expects, that government says, you know, go and get skills, and you're doing it, and then you try and go home, at the end of the day, they say, sorry, mate, it's not a quid, it's a fiver. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, we are. Um, and um, that, that will run for two years, after which we should have transport devolved. I mean, who knows what's going to happen with the government in the meantime, finances, but, you know, we, we're doing what we can on that. Um, so, two-part question. Where are we with the devolution deal? Um, this, the moment I was... That's, not literally true. The, the week I was elected, um, I started talking to other leaders in the region about coming together in a devolution deal. And it's fair to say I met with some mixed responses, um, which is me speaking euphemistically. Um, and what tipped it was when I was um, successful in persuading central government to include us in the transport money. And uh, as a process then after that, speaking to various different people, we've um, started negotiating in earnest. We'd have, so in the start of the pandemic, actually, it was the June time. If you remember, we went into lockdown at the end of March. We went into the June time. Um, started to do a piece of work about what would actually happen in the region, what we could get. And then it was the September time. For the first time ever as a region, we came together and put in a joint bid for the comprehensive spending review about a load of investment in the region. And then that comprehensive spending review never happened because of government being government. Um, and eventually we got to the point where in December last year we started negotiating in earnest as a six. Now up to that point we've been a seven and Durham were involved. Um, but post the 21 election when Durham ceased to be a Labour authority and it went into a, a rainbow coalition. Uh, actually they were still talking to us then. But... Um, a certain Prime Minister called Boris Johnson, you might remember one of his speeches, not the Peppa Pig one, I was there for the Peppa Pig one by the way, um, I, was, I was about this far away from him um, when he lost his place in his notes and he said, oh, oh, forgive me, oh, forgive me, forgive me, and that was the only time he's ever shown contrition for anything. <laughs> um, but um, we, we got the, move forward on the, the devolution negotiations, um, and he, in that speech in July last year, so what's that, sort of 15, 16 months ago, um, he said, oh, and anyone who wants a county deal can have one. And that meant that Durham then pursued that. So they came out with the negotiation process. So we negotiated. And um, the deal includes an investment fund, which is the largest per capita. Because I said, we've actually got a very good deal in the north of time. I said, I'm not going to accept a penny less per person than we've got in the north of time. Um, and even not everybody in the north of time was interested at that point. It took a bit of persuasion. Um, but then managed to get extra things in. Talking to, it, it, it's a very strange job because there's a, a lot of um, Tory ministers whose politics I find reprehensible, but you've got to try and be nice to them and win them over. And on a personal basis, you can sometimes get there. Who would have thought I would persuade a Tory Secretary of State for Education to agree to go into a devolution deal to co-fund our child poverty prevention work? No one else has managed that. So I think that's really <coughs> achievement. I'm very, very proud of it. 
Um, so there's a load of things in there. There's transport, there's extra um, powers and money on housing. Um, there's on the national networks like rail and road, there's full consultation powers now. Because at the moment, they, they ask you, but it's not proper co-design. So that on major road networks, we can um, have a genuine say. Um, the regional wealth fund in there. Uh, there's a whole range of things. Um, and um, we're trying to get that signed off during that brief period when Greg Clark was the Secretary of State for local government between um, the middle of July and um, the start of September when um, Ms Truss became Prime Minister and appointed a different set of people. Um, and they didn't quite get it over the line because central government wanted to hold it off so she would have some announcements to make. And boy, did she make some announcements. Um, not the ones we really wanted, um, but that's where we go. And in that time, Durham has said, well, actually, we would like to come in now. The county deal doesn't work for us because they're not going to give us as much unless we have a mayor and join a mayor of combined authority. Yeah, money speaks. Um, and I said, I'm very happy with that. Some of the others said, we are. Some of them said, we're, not, we're close to getting it. I'm not sure we like it because, you know, there's a lot of politics involved. Um, and... Um, so there's been discussions with central government. I was talking to Mike McGrove earlier. We all met with him last week, week before as well. And um, we, I would hope we will have something to announce quite soon. I was trying to get it announced this Thursday. Um, but um, unfortunately, we couldn't reach agreement between everybody to do that. Um, to be fair to Michael Gove, he was up for it. Um, and we are in the process now that if Durham come in, because that takes the population from 1.45 million to over 2 million, and that puts us close enough to being the biggest combined authority that doesn't have it. Not true. But he said he'd make us exception because we've got such a good track record in the north of time that he would put us at number one for what's called a trailblazer deal. And a trailblazer deal, and this is if it's, if it was at the second part of your question, um, Diana. This is where you go to the government and say, we want this, we want this, we want this, and they try and work out how to do it. Now, that's a massive difference because one of the things in the northeast is our school age education it just lags behind in terms of results the rest of the country for, for lots of reasons poverty being one of them it's, it's not to do with anything to do with the, the quality of the teaching staff um, there's around 640 kids excluded in the north of time in secondary school um, and actually in terms of off-rolling those who are gently pressured to just not turn up that's a, typically three times larger. It's hard to, to know because no one knows. And I know of cases of kids who've been excluded from school who are getting taxied across Northumberland three days a week to get to their provision. And no one knows what's happening the other two days a week. Now, 0.4% of the secondary school population, that doesn't sound like a big percentage. But forever after, that's 0.4% on the unemployment figures, 0.4% of people in and out of the criminal justice system. Because if you've had a bad school age education, the deck is stacked against you. And you get exceptional and resilient individuals that can come through that. But we should not be putting young people in that situation. So real devolution is where we get the chance to close that circle. Now, this comes down to us having control of our own money. And there's been talk about giving mayors more tax raising powers. And I've said no. The business rate base in the north of time is £300 per person. In London, it's £940 per person. So if they say, yeah, you've got the powers, just tax your people, we'd have to raise taxes on businesses three times higher than they would in London to bring them the same amount of money. In Newcastle and in Gateshead, roughly a quarter of people are on council tax support. We can't be putting up council taxes. What we should do is capture the wealth that we create. And this is like earn back. So... I've outperformed the jobs we should be doing by a factor of four. If I was the CEO of a company, of a global corporation, and I said, look, I've got four times the turnover and profit you expected, they would throw money at me to invest more. The central government, would we get any more for that extra success? Not a penny. So I had a conversation, it's gone back a while, with Treasury officials and some ministers, saying, how do we get extra money? And, um, and they said, uh, well, we don't trust you. Not you, Jamie. We don't trust anyone. We're the Treasury. That's what we do. But I said, how about for every job I create, you give me the first 18 months of the payroll taxes? And that averages out about seven and a half, eight thousand pounds per job we create. And it costs us about five thousand pounds to create a job on average. So then we 
can get the money that we're creating and become self-funding. Land value capture, that's the sort of stuff. When we close the circle and investors say, we know a better transport system saves people a fortune. We know retrofitting homes for every pound you spend on it saves 42p on the NHS alone because people are healthier. That's the sort of thing. We close that circle, we become masters of our own destiny with the money to build that northeast that we want to build. Yeah, good answer. <laughs> Right. Well, we do have time for a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. Brandon, uh, yes, give you the short answers. I, I don't think I need them. Okay. Um, I was actually going to ask before you started speaking, about the fact that um, you know the how secure is your funding? Because all of the good things that you're talking about depend primarily, I think, on funding from central government, despite all the other things that you're bringing in. So how secure is it, and over what time span? That, that's a nice easy question. It's a 30-year devolution deal. So from 2019 to 2049. I have no intention of being the mayor in 2049 and to retire long before then. Um, the, the good thing is, is that with the new deal, it restarts. So if that will come in in May 24, should, should it go ahead, um, and I'll have to fight a new election. That's when my term ends anyway. Um, so I'll fight a new election on the new footprint. Um, and if people will have me, um, that deal will then run for another 30 years. But the adult education budget, the problem with the core funding is it's fixed. And I did a calculation as soon as I knew I was going to be mad and worked out that 30 years time, that 20 million a year, which is the core north of time budget, would only be worth 7.5 million a year based on the historical inflation figures for the previous, previous decade or so. Um, that calculation is a bit obsolete now and uh, it'll end up being worth about 2 to 3 million, which isn't enough to do anything by the time you've paid your core costs. Um, which is why we're doing so much in terms of reinvestment. So that finance fund that we're using to put into supporting local small and medium enterprises, that will actually not only grow with inflation, it will grow above inflation, and that's the sort of approach we've got to take. Now, that seems a very pragmatic thing for a socialist to do, but actually it works. And isn't that me sneakily getting communal ownership over our economy? Isn't that what we actually want, a fair thing that works for our region? And it's, nobody's compelled to engage with that. It's done on a market basis, but that's one of the ways we can do things. Um, so the Brownfield Housing Fund and others get renegotiated at every comprehensive spending review. Um, and the City Region Sustainable Transport Settlement likewise, um, so that'll be renegotiated, uh, well to take effect in about three years time, um, although um, the negotiations will start long before then. Um, the adult education budget, well that's just increased um, in line with all standard departmental budgets. The truth is, of course, that in the nature of British parliamentary democracy, um, Parliament is sovereign and no Parliament can tie the hands of a future Parliament. So should someone want to decide to abolish it, they can. So should someone decide to impose martial law, they can. Um, but I'll tell you what, they'll have a hell of a fight on their hands if they try to abolish the Metro Mayors uh, mm -hmm. cross-party. <coughs> Right, any further questions for Jamie? Yes. Just on that last point, um, every referendum I've come across on Metro Mayors have been soundly defeated by a large majority of people who are in the North East soundly rejected regionalisation and yet it's been forced upon us. What's going on? Okay, uh, yeah. there wasn't a question in there, but there was an implied question. Um, there's actually there's never been a referendum on Metro Mayors. The 2004 referendum was for a regional assembly. Um, and one of the, the key things on that is, I remember at the time, people being asked, well, what powers will we get? Because it was going to be a regional assembly with lots of, um, a whole new layer of government, kind of a little bit modelled after perhaps Scotland or Wales, not quite the same. 
And the answer that came back when people said, what powers will we get, was, oh, well, that will be up to the Secretary of State. So they're asking people to vote for something without any idea of what they were going to get. Like Brexit. Um, <laughs> exactly like Brexit, which, you know, I do respect democratic decisions. But if you're going to say to people, um, do you want to do it? You've got to say, well, what that means. Um, otherwise, you're storing up an awful lot of problems. And um, so that 2004 referendum um, was rejected. When it came to the, uh, the creation of combined authorities, well, that was done with the consent, and still is done with the consent, of local elected officials. So there is a democratic process, albeit not a referendum. Um, and um, if you look at the polling from Centres for Cities, people actually really like the Metro Mayors because they see them, they know who they are, they do things, things happen, and it's around about 83% of people, very slightly but not much from region to region, want their Metro Mayors to have more powers and more <coughs> power. So actually there is an awful lot of public support and people are very kind to me in the street, so that's, that's a nice thing too. Uh, and uh, what was it, I was, I was going to make another point. Um, I think we'll finish there because All right. it was a very long point. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice. Uh, um, it just remains for me to thank Jamie for his presentation tonight and for answering all those questions, including mine. Um, and uh, I think you'll agree he's, he's got some great initiatives and we really want him as our mayor in 2024. Um, so, at least I do anyway. Um, <laughs> right, so yes, on the, the Regional Assembly uh, um, vote in, in 2004, um, I mean, it's gone down in mythology that the North East is not interested in regional government. Um, it was actually, um, there, there was a publication, I think in 2019, that said, uh, said that um, and it's just not true we do we want um, regional government we, we want our metro mayors and it's quite obvious from what Jamie has said this evening um, that it's a very good thing for the region that Jamie's work is terrific so I hope you'll all join me in uh, thanking Jamie once again Round of applause. <laughs>